Great to see all of you people sticking around. My wife, this is my wife, Jane, for those of you who don't know Jane. But she was praying that nobody would come. I know, I'm like, did y'all re really register for this class? <laughs> So uh, I'm, the, I'm the guy that likes to talk in front of people, and Jane is the uh, reticent one to do this. But uh, So you don't know the gold you are getting, because this is rare. Uh, but because of the subject of talking about just marriage and ministry, I talked her into it. So uh, she's got some great insights, and uh, hopefully what we'll share here in the next little bit as part of this workshop is going to uh, be encouraging and uh, hopefully even educational for some of you who are trying to figure out your rhythm and kind of your groove in life and in ministry. And uh, we've called this marriage and ministry together because I think that uh, regardless of how your marriage looks or the different giftings and in, in the different individuals in a marriage, when you do ministry, you do it together because everybody in your household really carries the weight of it. Uh, and let me quickly, I'll kind of set up the story, our story, for those of you who don't know it. And Jane is just going to chime in uh, and probably fix all of my mistakes in the middle of it here. But So Jane and I met in July of 1991. I was working at a Christian bookstore uh, in between semesters at Bible school. And uh, I was a Christian bookstore. I was the assistant manager, which meant nothing uh, other than that I just worked all the time. And Jane had just graduated from high school, and her mom would shop in the store that I was in, told her that we were hiring. She had a background uh, of doing like Hallmark cards, and so we had a Hallmark section. So I was, it was on a particular day, I was uh, talking to my boss in the middle of the store, and he was telling me all the reasons why, uh, if you're called into ministry, just meet a great young lady, Love her, get married young, build your lives together, and don't, don't mess around. Don't wait till you're 30. Don't play the field. Just get married. And uh, I knew that he had somebody coming in for an interview. And so Jane, in the middle of that conversation, Jane comes walking in. And I'm telling you, she was decked out. I mean, she's, she walked in. She had, it was the early 90s, so she had long, spiral, permed hair. And I remember looking at her. I was like, whoa. And I, I turned to my boss and I said, uh, well, hire her and then I'll marry her. And uh, so he did hire her and uh, she worked there for like... Three weeks? Yeah, maybe, maybe three four. weeks. Well, yeah, not very long. Maybe a month. Maybe a month. And uh, just long enough for me to ask her out. Uh, so our first date was July 9th, 1991, and we got married a year later, July 10th, 1992. And uh, so that was... July of 1991, married in July of 1992, and then in January of 1993, we moved to Kansas City, Missouri to our first ministry position. So but KC. somewhere in there we had Ashley. Yeah, oh yeah, we had right. October, <laughs> October, October of 90... Two, three. 93. Then, where's, where's Ashley? What year were you born? <laughs> 93. 93. Okay, so October 93. Yes. 94 then. Okay, yes, that's okay. right. January like 94. Months, yeah. <clears throat> so, man, we were just clipping it. That's when you know you're old, is when you don't know the years your kids are born in anymore. Um, so, we did a lot. I mean, our, our story was really uh, compressed. <clears throat> and I knew from the time I was a young teenager that I was called into ministry. And so, I was discipled, I was devout, I, was, I had a, a strong sense of direction. Jane uh, came from a great home where she had been in church uh, all of her life, went to Christian schools. Um, mom and dad were very involved in a denominational church. But when I met her, which I did not know, she really wasn't serving the Lord. Uh, saved, I wasn't. Yeah, you weren't even saved. So uh, then I... I did what I tell people not to do. I d it took me like maybe a month to figure out, maybe a couple of weeks to figure out she really wasn't saved. I like our second day, first day, I took her to Putt-Putt, <clears throat> uh, miniature golf and to McDonald's. I was a big spender, college kid. 
<clears throat> Second date is I took, I, t- <laughs> I took her to Christian roller skating night. Anybody remember those? It's like Friday night roller skating at Woodland Arena. And uh, so it quickly became apparent that she was not saved and had grown up in church, so had an understanding of religion. And then I did what I tell people not to do. I went into missionary dating mode. I'm like, well, let me lead her to the Lord. So I did. I prayed with her. She had, ne- she had grown up in church all of her life, morning and evening church, Christian schools, and had no idea that she needed to be born again. Had no idea um, what salvation was. Like, never had heard of salvation call or anything like that. And so I just figured while well, I was baptized as a baby, went to church, that was fine. And then Lee just kept asking questions like, well, when, when did you give your heart to the Lord? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I mean, just all these different things. And then he took me to church on a Sunday night. So I think we had gone Christian roller skating, which <laughs> was fun. And then um, I'll, I'll skip a whole story just for your embarrassment. Yeah. And then... Um, You can come and talk to me afterwards if you want to know the story. Tell the story. You can tell the story. (laughs) Well, so I'm trying to think if you had brought me to, if we had gone to church yet. I don't think we had. I don't either. I think maybe we had. Because I feel like it all went pretty quick that you had brought me to church and it was during worship that I actually was like, God is real. And I was like, what is this? You know what I mean? Like, I just sensed him so strong and he's like, that's, that's the, presence, that's of the God. presence of God. And then, then we prayed in my parents' driveway, the prayer of salvation. You led me yep. to the Lord right there. But then I think it was the next week or the week after because there was on um, a Cornerstone Sunday, Church. Sunday night? Yeah, maybe it was that night. Yeah, but there was Sunday a uh, Christian dance club called, oh, called Cornerstone. <laughs> I didn't know this was a story you were going into. <laughs> You can, oh my God. Right, I cannot I believe. It. You can tell. You, I'll tell well, you afterwards. If anybody box, wants right. to know afterwards, you can come up and Go I'll ahead. tell you. So. What's that? Are you? Are, you're not gonna, I'm not mad. You can tell it. Just tell the story. Now everybody wants to know. So you're gonna. So anyway, okay. I didn't know what a stud I was dating because we go. He asked me to go um, with him to a Christian club, and I'm going. Oh my gosh, I've gone Christian Grand roller skating. Like, I'm not going to a Christian club. What in the world is this? It's a dance club. All this underground stuff that I had no idea was even around, you know? And so he takes me to this Christian dance club. <clears> and he's like kind of has longer hair at the time and has these big jeans on and tennis shoes and a t-shirt. And we literally walk in that room and everyone's like, Elsie's in the house. And I was like... What in the world is this? And Lee walked up to the stage, on the stage, and started to break dance. He was a really good break dancer. Like, amazing. And people were, like, clearing off the floor and letting I can never speak at this conference again. And it was so funny. I was like, oh, my gosh, she's cool. So, in a Christian world. No, I'm kidding. I had a lot of growing to do. In a Christian weird kind of way. Right. It, was, it was a church that had like an alternative nightclub for Christians. He couldn't roller skate, but he could dance. Yeah, I couldn't roller skate. <clears throat> roller skated good enough to get you to marry me, so. I couldn't roller skate either. No, so. we did it together. So so there, there you go. Now you know part of the secret. So <laughs> I used to break dance. Uh, so... I, the story I thought you were going to tell was on Sunday night when <laughs> I would never have authorized that story. Uh, no, when she came to church with me on a Sunday night, the first Sunday night, it was a Pentecost, uh, Pentecostal church. So I'm like, please do not let anything weird happen. And sure enough, this uh, Mexican lady stood up and spoke in tongues. And I'm like, oh my gosh, really? Lord, not tonight. And I kind of out of the corner of my eye to look to see how she was responding. And she was fine. We got into the car and I was like, oh, maybe she won't say anything. And she goes, I love the service. And I go, really? And she goes, yeah, I mean, I felt the presence of God there. And I said, that's, 
that's amazing. And she goes, and I love how they translate for the Spanish, too. I mean, <laughs> and so she had never even heard of what that was. And uh, so I thought that's the story. But anyways, so I led her to the Lord in the driveway, baptized her in her mom and dad's cottage on Big Star Lake and up in uh, uh, Baldwin, Michigan. Uh, what's that? I was praying there with Ashley. Yeah, you're, that's right. And, uh, and then we went right into ministry. And we learned uh, pretty quick as a, a couple that there were some things that they did not teach us in Bible college about marriage and ministry. Uh, and that's what we want to share with you over the next few minutes is just some of the things that they don't teach you in Bible college about marriage and ministry that uh, we've learned over, well, this summer we'll be married 29 years. So 29 years, been in marriage or in ministry for 28 years. And throughout that period of time, some things we've learned by mentors, some things we've learned by the hard way. Uh, but each one of these things, I think, are vital lessons that we have learned about doing marriage and ministry together. So Jane's just gonna kind of jump in and probably tell some more embarrassing stories about me along the way here. It'll be awesome. Uh, so five things that they don't teach you in Bible college about marriage and ministry. First one is that uh, ministry will take as much of your life as you will allow it to. Merit, or ministry will take as much of your marriage, it'll take as much of your family, as much of your time as you are willing to surrender it. <clears throat> and it's so important that when you go into ministry, full-time vocational ministry, that you premeditate the boundaries of your time and of your relationship and your family ahead of time together because if you don't, immediately you're, it won't be very long and you're going to experience conflict, uh, burnout, uh, unmet expectations, and it might look different for everybody. For us, when we uh, moved down here from Grand Rapids and planted, those of you who are church planters, you know this, this is especially true because there's always something to do. Ministry is unlike any other calling or any other job because it's 24-7. It's who you are, and it's in relationship with God. It's not like... Um, it's not like, you know, you work at a factory and then you come home and you unplug until the next morning. It's 24-7. And early on, a couple of the things that we did, and I think Jane did uh, some of this really well, uh, was we set some clear boundaries for our family and for our marriage. And one of those was that Fridays was our Sabbath day and it was our date day. And so even when our kids were little, uh, Fridays were sacred. Uh, I would occasionally do a wedding or, or something like that, you know, on a Friday. But if I was going to do something on a Friday, I would always check with Jane to make sure that it was good because, you know, you could go 24-7 and never take a day off and just, well, it's the Lord's work. It's got to get done. And, you know, there's these people need this and this person needs this. The needs of the people will always be there. And you have to make sure that you're keeping your family, your marriage, your body healthy so that you can take care of people. And having a Sabbath on a Friday uh, was always important for us. And that was the day, I called it Jane's day because we did whatever Jane wanted to do on Fridays. And so what do we, I mean, we used to go out to lunch. Go to the mall, go to lunch. Go Sometimes to the family we, Christian right, store. exactly, yeah. which was more his thing. But um, into I just want to quick throw in that um, because I grew up in a denomination that women, um, like the pastor's wives, I never saw them preach or go on the stage or do anything like that. And then being thrown mm -hmm. into um, the charismatic world where the pastor's wives, you know, weren't just the piano players, but they were <laughs> supposedly supposed to preach and all this. And that, for me, for years, until I just kind of gave it to the Lord, and I was like, God, you made me. You know who I am. I don't want to strive. I don't want to. I mean, I'll do anything that you ask me to do because I love you and I love your people, but I'm not going to um, right. hate 
ministry because I feel like I have these undue expectations that aren't coming from you, that are coming from me and maybe other people. Yeah. And um, so for any woman out there that feels like I want to support my husband, but I don't want to preach, I don't want to get on stage, I'll do it if God asks me to, but it's not like I want to do this weekly or this or that, that you are fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. As long as you're obedient to the Lord and you're doing what he's asked you to do and you do it even in fear, <clears throat> like I don't want to do this today, but because I love my husband and I love God and I love all of you, I'll do it. You know what I mean? But I'm not clamoring to do this every week. Um, so I just want to like encourage the wives out there and husbands not to put pressure on your wives if it isn't their calling. Yep. Like you can encourage them and all those kind of things because yep. Lee has always done that for me. Um, but yeah, know, yeah. know your spouse, know their gifts, know their callings and yep. then um, cultivate those things. Don't try to make them something that they aren't and that is what I truly appreciate Lee over almost 30 years of ministry is that he hasn't, he's pushed me when I needed to be pushed, but he's also covered me when I needed to be covered. And so, thank you. That's been easy. <clears throat> so that's part of the boundaries and you know, where in your church oftentimes, it, it may be time that you have to protect, uh, and, but it also might be your family that you need to protect. Because people will have expectations of you, of your family, of your kids. Uh, and Jane was always brilliant at, uh, she was the most amazing mom. I mean, uh, I would come home. One of the things I did was I would always set a, uh, a time, and it was like Monday through Friday, or Monday through Thursday, and then weekends as well. At five o'clock, no later, I went home. And it was because there was always stuff when you're uh, in a small church or in a developing church, really at any stage, if you're a workaholic, you, you'll stay and you'll always find a reason to stay. So I made a predetermined decision. I'm gonna come home at five, <clears throat> unless it was Wednesday nights when we had church or something like that. But when I would come home, Jane was always uh, taking care of, of the kids when they were little and creating an environment of worship and an, an environment uh, of engagement with our kids, and I love that. And then we, you would have people that come into the church who wanted to put pressure on me to be something that I'm not, or Jane to be something that she's not, or our kids. It's like, oh, you're pastor's kids. You know, you have to act a certain way. And we just made a decision. It's like, look, we're going to be who we are, and we're going to. I don't want my kids to have to live under the pressure of being something better than everybody else because they're our kids. We wanted our kids to love God, not because we're pastors, but because if I worked in a, in a shop, I wanted my kids to love Jesus. Because they're Christians. Right, it's because That's we're so Christians real. and we want you to love Jesus. And you're gonna go to church, not because we worry if somebody doesn't see you, but because this is what we do on vacation. We go to church. We don't go to church because we're pastors. We're pastors because we love the church. And the same is true with Jane. People would come oftentimes and say, well, you know, is Jane gonna preach or does Jane lead worship? I'm just like, no, you don't understand. Jane has her hands full encouraging me. Uh, and she's a world-class mother. And if you are lucky enough to get in her inner circle where she mentors you, I'll tell you what, she is an incredible encourager and mentor. And that's how God has wired her. That's her, her interest, that's her calling, and that's her gifting and it's a perfect match to me because the way that God wired me is I don't want somebody who is trying to push out front and take more platform time or those kinds of, so, some guys love that. That was not how I'm wired. God knew exactly what we needed when he put us together. And so we protect that. We protect our kids. We protect our marriage. Uh, and we recognize that we're, we're going to give Jesus our lives but we're not gonna give the ministry our lives. And those are two different things. <clears throat> we're gonna love Jesus with all of our heart. We will go wherever he calls us to go. We will do whatever he calls us to do. But I'm not gonna sacrifice our family or our marriage on the altar of ministry. And so things like going home at five o'clock, uh, not being gone uh, more than three nights a week, 
uh, taking family vacations, uh, making sure, you know, that, uh, that, our, that we, had, we would always do a vision retreat. We would get away and do two or three days uh, a year and pray together and have fun together, go out to eat, and then, you know, work through what are we believing for the kids this year and what are, what are our goals for our marriage this year? Pray together and, uh, and, and make sure that those are priorities. Second thing kind of bleeds into this, which is <clears throat> out of the five things, is there is no set pattern on what a pastor's wife role should look like. And I think that this is important because the hardest job in the church is not the senior pastor's job. The hardest job in the church is being the wife to the senior pastor. Uh, It is hard because it is an undefinable role. If you're a pastor, if you're a worship leader, everybody knows what's expected of you. Uh, when you are a youth pastor, everybody knows what's expected of you. When you're a senior pastor, everybody knows what's expected of you. When you are married to the senior pastor, and there may be some of you, the senior pastor is the wife, and it could be the opposite where, you know, if it's the gentleman, that role is not clearly defined. And it has, and the reason why it's not clearly defined is because it takes on different specificity depending on who the person is. There are some pastors' wives, and we have friends that are like this, where they're co-pastors, and they they lead together. There are some where the pastors' wives uh, love to teach and be out front or lead a women's ministry. There are some pastors' wives who don't want anything to do with those things, and they're raising the family, and they love their husband, but they don't have a ministry-specific role. And why I think that's important to understand is uh, kind of caveat off of the first point was probably the, one of the biggest challenges we've faced, and we've also seen other people walk through in ministry, is not understanding what that particular calling is and living beyond people's expectations. It's just been huge. And so uh, it can create tension in the marriage. It can create pressure on spouse. Uh, It can uh, steal your joy out of ministry and out of life. Uh, All of those things. And none of those things are fair. I've oftentimes said, Jane, you have the hardest job in our church. Uh, And over the course of this year's 25 years that we've been at Radiant, but over the course of 25 years, Jane has been courageous enough that whenever people have tried to put those expectations on her, she knows who she is. She's just like, no, this is who I am. I'm not gonna be something other than I am. And it's been my uh, responsibility to affirm that and to protect that in her. And so I would just say, if you're married and you're in ministry together, it's important that you communicate and you clearly define what the expectations are, what the roles are for you and for your church, and then you protect those and then affirm those really big time. Affirm those because it's in those dark areas where the enemy whispers and like gets in your imagination and, oh, she wishes I was more of this or he wishes I was more of that or maybe the church would be bigger if I was doing this or maybe the church would be bigger if I wasn't doing this and nobody wants me. All of those things are just the the weapons of the enemy to divide and conquer from the top down and you have to protect that. Anything you want to say added on to that? No. Um, Well, I guess. Um, See? I think... Literally, for the first probably 10 years of, of ministry, I would just, at different times, just beg Lee, like, can you just be a garbage man? Can you just <laughs> a be break a, dancer? A break dancer. Can you? Because I was just feeling like just this insecurity. Um, and I just had to grow. And really dig deep into the Lord. I think I already shared that, but of going, yeah. um, this is who I am. Yeah. And but you always were very supportive. Yeah. I mean, she never. Uh, there was never a moment where you like gave an ultimatum, like you know we have to go do something else. Right. You knew the call on my life. You just felt like, man, all of these people are expecting so much. Mm-hmm. And especially in the circle of churches we were kind of running in at that particular time, it was kind of like, oh, if you're a senior pastor, your wife has to be this. And that's not fair to do to anybody. It's not fair. Listen, God doesn't make carbon copies. 
God makes unique individuals. And there is nothing about you in ministry or you in life or you in marriage that God is not uniquely crafted to be exactly the way that he is in its redeemed form. And you don't have to try and be anybody. The worst trap we get into as pastors or as leaders or even spouses is that comparison game. We've got to be so careful about that because we can all, I mean, probably all have at one time or another. It's like, oh, you know, Jimmy Evans is one of my mentors and, and he's got this huge marriage ministry and I can't tell you how many times he has picked up the phone over the years when I've called him and I've just said, Jimmy, uh, what do I, you know, what, what's wrong with me or what do I need to do or how do we do this? You know, we're trying to navigate this whole thing and he's the one that has told us over and over again. He's like, God created you to be perfect matches for one another. There is absolutely nothing wrong. That's nothing but the lie of the enemy. As soon as you guys, as soon as you communicate that in your marriage and you pray and you protect that, it's amazing the unity and the synergy that comes out of that. I would not be uh, the man that I am if it was not for this woman sitting right next to me. I, I promise you. She has been my greatest encourager, my prayer partner, my friend. When I am weak, she has been incredibly strong. Uh, she's believed in me. And God knew that that's exactly what I needed. And you have exactly who you need. If you're married, you're in ministry together, it's not by accident. Uh, God has uniquely gifted and crafted you guys together, and you need to love and appreciate that. Uh, number three, your words at home either empower or hinder your words on stage. Um, how many of you have ever either taught a small group or taught on a platform a marriage series or a family series? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Okay, how many know that you are gonna get into a fight with your spouse about three hours before you have to teach that. <clears throat> it's going to happen. Uh, but the reality is, is that communication, Jimmy Evans says this, words are nuclear. Words can either be used to empower our marriage because that nuclear power, or they can be used to destroy our marriage like a nuclear bomb. But words are nuclear. And the words that we use and the language that we use, uh, the things that we talk about at home, either empower or hinder the authority and the anointing that we have on stage. Whether you're a worship leader, it applies to you when you're leading worship. Uh, you're a senior pastor, teaching pastor, it applies to you. Youth pastor, it applies to you. Your words have such incredible power to either empower one another, empower your kids, or to hinder. And it has a ripple effect on what you do in ministry and in the church. Uh, I'll tell a, a, a story on myself. And Jane's like, okay, just don't tell any on her. Um, so uh, living in Kansas City, I was a youth pastor, and Jane had two small children at home, uh, Ashley and Jared, one? The Walmart parking lot one. You were pregnant. So we had Ashley and Jared was in the hopper. And, uh, <clears throat> and it was so hot oh. and humid. And we had no air conditioning in the house or the car. Or in our car. So, so it was like 100 degrees, total humidity, and we're miserable. <clears throat> so it was after church on a Sunday. And what I will say is learning to protect time and family was something that took me a few years to learn. I didn't do that right away. I was all about building something that people would respect. And so this particular Sunday, we're in the car. We are pulling uh, into Walmart for some reason. I don't know what it was. but And I told her, do you remember what it was? It's probably a date. Yeah, it was our date at Walmart. Um, <laughs> and I told her one of the kids in the youth group uh, had a birthday or a going away party that Sunday afternoon, and we needed to go there to say goodbye. And Jane's like, you know, she's pregnant, she's not feeling good, and she wants to go home, and she goes, I, I don't wanna go to that. And I'm like, babe, we have to go. We have to go, just stop in, just say goodbye. And she goes, you didn't tell me about this, and I don't wanna do it. And I'm like, Jane, we have to do it. I can't not go. Because in my mind, I'm like, I have to go, you know, because of all the connections and parents and everything like this. And 
I know, right where we were in the parking lot. I mean, I was just getting so mad. And she's just like, I don't want to go. And how many of you have ever said something before you thought about it? <clears throat> and then heard yourself say it and wish you could rewind the tape and edit it? So I looked at her. I'm like, you know what? Living with you sometimes is like living with my worst enemy. And as soon as I, here's how it came out of my mouth. Living with you. It was like slow motion as I'm saying it. And then I said it and I saw the hurt on her face. And she just looked at me. She got mad and she goes, take me home. And I apologized over and over and over again. But do you know what? Uh, you gain trust with spoonfuls and you lose trust in buckets. And you can, you build uh, love and affirmation little at a time, but you can lose it quickly. And in that moment, I lost a lot of it and uh, had to make up for it. But, you know, throughout the years, some of the things really practically that we've learned about words at home was be really careful about uh, even things that we say around our kids about church situations, people in the church, because we are maybe going through something with somebody who's, you know, uh, in the church doing something, gossiping, or, you know, doing something we don't like, or even a staff person. Uh, and if you just talk about it casually and your kids pick up on it, you will get over it, but your kids will be marked by it. There and your are, kids are crazy, and you all know <clears throat> this of your parents. Like, you can tell them to go to bed and they don't hear you, but then you whisper about somebody and they're Four like... Four hallways down. Right, and they're like, what? And they all come running in. What? Tell me why. And I'm like, oh my gosh, go to bed. Yeah, they all want the tea, you know. Uh, and kids remember, it's like they don't remember, hey, clean your room and take the garbage out and feed the dog. You do this every day. They don't remember that, but they remember 20 years later some, you know, oh, I remember that situation and I remember what you said and they remember those things. So we've always been very careful. We wanted our kids to think everybody in our church was angels. Uh, and so we would, you know, we weren't always perfect in that, but we made a real effort to talk about that after they went to bed. Uh, alone in the living room uh, or alone in our bedroom and have those conversations. And, and then also to really speak purpose and identity over our kids because words have power and over each other. Yep. And we learned that that wasn't, you're going to be in the ministry or you're going to be pastors or whatever. It was, you're going to love God. You're going to fulfill what God has called you to do and your purpose and all those Things and never put the pressure on them yeah. to be in ministry. So yeah. I never come down, mm -mm. never come down hard on them because of church stuff. It was like, look, I, I don't want you sneaking out of the Sunday school classroom, which Jared did. Which Jared did a lot. Uh, not again, not just because you're a pastor's kid, but because we want you to be a good kid. And we want you to behave and we want you to have manners and all those kinds of things. So we would work really hard at speaking life and knowing that our words were nuclear, both in our marriage between one another. And I would feel a direct connection when our marriage was healthy and our communication was good. I felt the anointing in a stronger way as, as I preached and as I did ministry. When there's tension here, it's difficult to do that. Because if you can compartmentalize that, there's something unhealthy even in your own soul, that you can compartmentalize this and give into that. Uh, but it, it, would, it would bother me if we would get in an argument. One of, the things that, uh, one of the things that made sure that we had constant communication is I always knew Friday was coming, which was, listen, Friday is going to be a date day. So if we don't talk for a couple days, we're going to have to. Uh, and if you don't schedule that, then you can avoid it for weeks on end. But a lot of times, uh, you have to be quick to forgive. You have to be quick to overlook, quick to say you're sorry. Uh, and if you'll do that, and you can keep communication really healthy in your marriage. Yep. And just to throw it out there, because we're all adults. But when we did the marriage retreat, and um, our kids were little, like scheduling date days, scheduling sex, scheduling. Can you say all, that again? All of that was just 
so important because your week would just fly by. And that was one of the things that we had learned from Jimmy yeah. Evans. And so on our marriage retreat, we'd be like, this day, this day, this day, this week. You yeah. know what I mean? That These are the days. And um, Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay. So just to throw it out there because time can go so fast. And that is a gift from the yeah, Lord. And true. not to yeah. make it weird yeah. or whatever. So. Yep. For sure. Amen. Uh, we don't want it to get weird. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Number four, uh, things they don't teach you in Bible college about marriage and ministry is that people inside the church can be just as cruel as people outside the church. Uh, you know, I think you understand the dynamics of ministry in the church oftentimes uh, thinking that your greatest resistance or uh, difficult people that you're going to encounter will be people that don't believe what you believe or don't come to church or are kind of out there. But as soon as you get into ministry, you find out that people are people. And even saved people can be difficult people because we're all in progress. Uh, God is working on all of us. It's hard to keep in mind sometimes that God loves the very people uh, that we despise sometimes or that we don't want to be around or we don't like or who are even giving us a hard time. And I think sometimes that surprises us, at least it surprised us, that when we planted a church and started that uh, some of our greatest challenges relationally or even uh, just dealing with difficult people were actually not people outside of the church, they were people from within the church. Um, what, I guess you could put it like this, is they don't teach you that sheep bite. <laughs> and, uh, it, and that can be very hurtful because I know we oftentimes highlight people who've been hurt in church, but what very few people talk about is pastors who've been hurt in church. It's because you're not allowed to talk about that. Uh, it's like, you're the pastor, you're the one in authority. But you know what, it hurts. It hurts. And some of our most difficult times and seasons uh, in pastoring and even in, because again, everything flows into ministry. It affects your family. It affects your marriage. Uh, has been dealing with, you know, gossip uh, or rumors or people that you loved that you thought were going to be there for the duration who all of a sudden tell you that they're not coming back or they're going to a different church and then you find out that you know, they're bad-mouthing you or somebody who misunderstands something that you said and they take that and they get offended at that. Uh, sheep bite sometimes and it can be very difficult. Now, here's a statistic John Maxwell said years ago that I had a hard time believing when I heard it, but I believe it now. <clears throat> he said that the average pastor, when, uh, when the average pastor leaves a church, he leaves because of less than five people. It only takes a couple people who are really causing problems or really giving you a difficult, especially in like a board run church uh, or um, where a, a key leader or a staff person, <clears throat> it can discourage a pastor and a, a pastor's family so badly. Or, and you can apply this across the board. It can be youth ministry, it could be leading worship. It could be uh, a missionary. Uh, that it, when you have difficult people that you're supposed to be doing life and ministry with, you're supposed to be pulling in the same direction, uh, and then you see kind of the, the meanness or the unkindness or the breach of trust or betrayal or something like this. If you're not expecting it and you don't know it, it can knock the wind right out of you and get you to just be like, you know what? I don't need to do this anymore. Uh, there's probably been three times in 25 years that we've experienced really difficult relational issues that were to the point where, maybe two, where I have personally thought, you know what, I'm done. I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I don't want to do this. Uh, we can go someplace else. We can go do something else. This is not worth it because it hurts so badly. And the thing that has gotten us through that is us being able to communicate and, and talk about it and pray together 
and encourage one another. Sometimes I'm taking it harder than she's taking it. Uh, and she always steps in and is my greatest encourager. And then there's times where she's worn out and I'm reminding her of what God's called us to, what he has done, the people that love us, the faithfulness of God to get us through previous seasons. And it's, it's, it's that, uh, that Ecclesiastes that, you know, two are better than one and that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. Uh, we need that in those times. Yep. And so to have just close friends that you're able to bounce things off and yeah we've had some great talk. ministry yeah. friends yes and i love that because you're able to you're in the same boat and you yeah. are able to just be like i yeah. want to quit and then they're like no 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 you don't want to and so john, john and lisa Preminsky is sitting down here uh they planted their church about a year after us <clears throat> Dear friends. And uh, him and his wife, Lisa, are dear friends. And man, we have, uh, we have cried with each other. We have prayed with each other. We've uh, met up on Fridays for date days and kept each other from quitting uh, multiple, multiple times. And uh, you have to have some great friends in ministry. Be Go ahead. Uh, what were you going to say? Well, and then I was going to say, then there's always those seasons of people just leaving and they leave well. And, they, and you bless them. Yeah. And then it's always fun to see years later them come back. And yeah. they've learned from their experience in being in a different church. And they come back and bring different things. And, and so it's when you leave well and you bless people that it's such an amazing thing. Because obviously you never want to control <clears throat> anyone and be like, you can never leave. You have to stay. I mean, that would be a cult. And... Um, so it's just this beautiful thing when somebody leaves and then they come back and then you're like, oh, there you are. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah. love that. And so don't ever, like, when somebody yeah. leaves, be like, oh, I just, I can't stand them. And, you know, they hurt yeah. me. And I mean, all those things might be true, but then you just pray through it and then, and then it's fun. Maybe 10 years later, they yeah. come back and like, oh my gosh, we it both happens. grew because nobody's a perfect leader or person. I mean, we all have room to grow. Yeah. And just because we're sitting up here and he's the, uh, I mean, we all have room to grow. So Keep your heart pure. Mm -hmm. Keep your heart right. Uh, so when people leave, we bless them. We tell them, we love you. The door is always open. Now, there are a few people we've said, no, as soon as you leave, the door locks behind you. You can never come back. <laughs> Uh, but most, 99% of the time, it's like, you're always welcome back. And it's surprising when people do come back. If you don't keep your heart right when that happens, uh, your bitterness won't impact them, but it will impact you. And, uh, and having those close friends that you can confide in that are doing ministry like you're doing ministry, maybe not within your, ch your church context. You have to be careful about that. But outside of that, to reach out to them and just say, hey, I'm, go I'm going through it. Uh, that's, that's vital. You have to have that. And, uh, you know, there's times where we can over-spiritualize things and say, well, you know, it's the devil or it's this or that. No, and it, it's just, you have to just be honest. It's like, no, in my humanity, I'm just really hurt. This isn't demonic. This isn't the, I'm just hurt. I'll never forget, I called one of my mentors, uh, Pastor Lauren Covarubias, at Mount Zion, uh, I, and he's been a, a sort, I see the uh, family down here, uh, but I was thinking about, I was 26 years old, we were a year into the church, and we had this guy who claimed to be a prophet, and he was in our church, he's trying to blow it up, and then he, he left, and when he left, he's like, you know, Michelob is written over the door, and I told him, I said, I think you mean Ichabod, and because he was like, the glory has departed. But I called Pastor Lauren and, and <laughs> I told him, I said, uh, what do I do? I said, this guy, is, this guy is like trying to decimate our church. We're 100 people. He's like, he's trying to decimate this church. I said, but I know that God's got a lot of control. You know, I, I know that God's in control. Pastor Lauren said, well, he says, it sounds to me like uh, this isn't an issue of God's sovereignty. This sounds like to me, you just need to tell this guy to leave. 
And I'm just like, that was just really good practical wisdom. And so I just told the guy, I was like, yeah, I don't think you should probably come back here. And uh, you know what? As soon as you get rid of the gossiper or you get rid of that ac accusing voice, it's amazing how much peace comes on your, your house. Um, the fifth thing is uh, that we've learned is that spiritual warfare begins at home. Uh, and I think that the greatest weapon that we have in spiritual warfare, in ministry, as couples, uh, is to pray together. There is incredible power uh, in unified prayer, especially in couples that are in ministry. Uh, for years, uh, prayer has always come very easy to me just because of my connection with the Lord. I was young when the Lord spoke to me and called me, and so I had this relationship with God as my father that I, that I leaned on so deeply. So prayer was a, a natural part of my life. I've always been drawn to that. Uh, I was surprised at how vulnerable I felt once I got married than praying with Jane. Because for me, I had grown up, my mom uh, was kind of a Christian, not, not deeply devout, but my stepfather was not, and my biological father was not. So my relationship with God, starting as a child, really, but then at 12, called into ministry, became my private relationship with God. So it was me, and I had to almost guard it in my house. So now in our house, with it being at the center of it, and we're newly married, and Jane is my wife, and we're one flesh, and we're doing this together, I felt so awkward and so uh, vulnerable, is the only way to put it, to pray together that we just wouldn't do it. And she would communicate to me, you know, I just, on our vision weekends, we would get away, and she goes, I just want us to pray together. And I was, I'd always say, yeah, I want us to pray together, but in my heart, in my mind, it was just, it was like, it was hard for me to let somebody else into that part of my life. It's hard to explain, but it was just hard to let somebody else get in there. I felt like maybe she'll laugh at me or, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it was, I felt naked. And it wasn't until, it was years into our marriage that we actually began to do that. And to see the powerful impact of that, of what it did in our relationship, what it did in our kids, what it did in the church, and just the, the, the way that it warded off the enemy from both of us and, and our, our, from our kids and in our marriage made me wish that I had done it from the very beginning. And I, 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 I credit her for driving us towards that. So now, you know, we pray together. And it doesn't have to be a deep, you know, 30 minutes of Shundai, Hyundai, see me tie my bow tie. It doesn't... Uh, <laughs> It doesn't have to be, let's pray through the Lord's Prayer, you know, could you not tarry one hour? Uh, it, but it's, it's holding hands, it's thanking God for the day, it's asking his protection over our family, it's giving him thanks for our protection, interceding for different things as they need come up. And I'll tell you, when you do that, the enemy cannot divide you. The enemy cannot divide you. And I would, I would just encourage any ministry couples, if you, if this has been difficult for you to pray together, talk about it, ask God to give you a grace to do it, and just do it. There are a lot of things in ministry that we just do, a lot of things in life we just do, not because we enjoy it at first or not because we're experts in it, but we just do it. And as you do it, you'll begin to enjoy it. You'll begin to see the grace of God that shows up in your life. And uh, I, I, I firmly believe this. The couple that prays together stays together. I've never met a couple that prays together on a daily basis that ends up divorced. I've never, I've never met that couple. And that's in ministry and that's outside of ministry. Uh, if, and, and the enemy wants to keep you from doing that because prayer is not just something we do in church. Prayer needs to be in our homes. We need to teach our kids to pray. They need to pray with us and uh, we need to help them learn how to pray. I used to pray over our kids every night when we put them to bed, lay hands on our kids, pray over them. If I did not pray over our kids, they would like take my hand and like put it on their head. They wanted me to like pray over them. And we pray blessing and destiny and purpose and calling over them. And prayer needs to be at the center of our homes. And when you do that, the war, half the battle's already won at that point. 
And um, on that note, too, for praying for your kids, is that if you have prodigals, just remind the Lord of those prayers. That's good. And um, he's faithful for that, too. Yeah. Our son is a bit of a prodigal right now, and it's just always reminding the Lord you know, just yep. that he's tasted you, he's seen you, he knows that you're good and not giving up or not, you know, yep. all those kind of things too. So yep. we pray God, sick him. Yep. I mean, and, you know, we pray over those moments that we know that they've encountered the Lord, words that God has spoken over them. And they're, you, pray, you pray in their adulthood, but you pray, with, pray over them as, when they're children. And you know what, parents, we prophesy over all kinds of people in our church. We need to prophesy over our kids. They need to hear the word of the Lord spoken and declared by their parents over them. Same way that the father spoke over Jesus in the baptism. Jesus didn't need it. He's God. But there was something about that power of prophetic affirmation that unlocked his ability to walk in obedience. So pray over your kids. Pray in your marriage. And uh, I believe with all my heart you do those things and you're going to have many, many years of enjoyable ministry together. Uh, can we just pray over you guys real quick as we finish up today? Lord, thank you for the gift of marriage and thank you for the privilege of ministry. Lord, we minister to you out of the overflow of our marriage. And I pray right now over every marriage, over every couple in this room right now, I just pray, Lord, whatever challenges that they're going through, whatever just feels insurmountable, that, Lord, you would give them a vision of health, strength, and longevity. Lord, we want to live long lives of strong marriage, 50, 60, 70 years of marriage that we pass on as a legacy to the next generation that has seen fatherlessness and no-fault divorce and self-centeredness just decimate the nuclear family. God, in this room is the nucleus for a revival of marriage and family. Lord, help us to do it well. Help our ministries to not just be based on our gift, but based on the momentum and based on the synergy that we have as husbands and wives. I pray over every worship leader, pray over every youth pastor, every associate pastor, over every senior pastor and his wife, over every apostolic leader, over every prophetic couple. Lord, whatever we're doing to serve you in ministry, we don't want to do it to the detriment of our marriage, and we don't want to do it to the exclusion of our marriage. Give us all ears to hear and eyes to see what you're saying and speaking over us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. We love you. You're free to move about the cabin.